So thank you for having me. I uh, actually brought a couple friends. So Drew and Connor in the back, we work together uh, day to day and they uh, have an office in downtown Wheaton, which has a glow in the dark sign at night. Uh, it was great to have them. Uh, and then John uh, is a mentor of mine and we partner on some ministry things. Uh, and I tried to tell John, cause I'm always asking, he's built a company way, way bigger than mine. I was like, John, you can't sit here. And I asked him if he just wanted to talk to you instead. And he insisted that he did not want to, uh, but thank you for being here as well. Um, so I was thinking yesterday on uh, the plane, what I should talk to you about. Um, and the prompt I thought of was, if I was in your shoes, which is now about 10 years ago, what do I wish someone would have said to me? Um, I don't think that means I certainly have all the answers. There's many people like uh, Dr. Lee and John uh, that I've you know, leaned on for advice that have shaped me dramatically over the years. Uh, and people like Drew and Connor, where we're really trying to go through it a little bit as peers, uh, as entrepreneurs and as dads and as husbands. Um, but I think there is a freshness of perspective that someone who's 10 years out hopefully has over uh, someone who's 30 years out of your shoes because our priorities and experiences do change. So I've got 12 principles uh, that I thought of that I thought would be interesting to use to shape our discussion. You can ask questions at any point. Uh, and honestly, I don't expect you to remember uh, most of it. If even three months from now, you remember one of the 12 things, I think that would be uh, a huge success in my eyes. But um, before I do that, I would just say I have known Dr. Lee for, uh, like he mentioned, about 12 years now. Um, and he's made such a difference in my life to the degree that when I got married during COVID, he was the only person there. It was me, the girl I married, and him standing there on Zoom, much to the chagrin of my parents, as her parents got COVID uh, a couple days before we got married. Um, he, uh, he's Hadabuchi, which is Korean grandfather name to our little son, uh, who can only sort of speak. Um, but it's just been a huge privilege. Uh, and I would just say he's very passionate about being here to want to get to know all of you, not just for when you're here, but for many years, uh, down the road. So he's just been someone I can call so many times. He's come out to Connecticut for our advisor meetings. He's met employees and talked to us and, uh, and he really single-handedly, uh, I think I'd credit with trying to get me to integrate faith into my career in a way that I never would have thought of outside of knowing him. So I would just say, I think you're in good hands and take advantage of the office hours and lunches and all the things because uh, when you're not here anymore, you'll, you'll miss that. Um, so the first principle I had, so I broke it into two categories and, uh, and this might surprise you, but the first six are actually just principles of walking with God. They have nothing to do with your career explicitly, even though we are in a business class. And the reason is, is I was thinking yesterday about the people I know that are 10 years out of Wheaton. Uh, I think you'd be shocked how many are now divorced, how many now don't believe in Jesus, how many now uh, you know, have a different interpretation of the Old Testament's relevance, or how many go to church, or how many um, have substance abuse issues, or all these things that when I was in your shoes, I would have thought that following Jesus, if you took my class that was sitting here like you and projected it out 10 years, I would have thought that uh, you know, 99% would look similar to how they're following Jesus now. Um, and that hasn't remained true in my experience, just watching um, how life has played out. And I, I think that's a sobering thing, but I, I think what we should do about that as Christians who genuinely believe in Jesus is try to understand you know, what safeguards can we put in our life now such that as we're uh, trying to follow God in the world, we can because the world is a, is a nasty place in the sense that there's a lot of sin that this place is sheltering you from. And if you grew up in a Christian home, you've probably been sheltered from a lot of your life that uh, when it hits you in the face in your first job and someone's asking you to lie to get customers or uh, so there's different opportunities to breach integrity when you start doing your own taxes or you start um, being exposed to different freedoms. I, I think there's a, a real awareness here of you're kind of in Rivendell a little bit of a, a place where you're surrounded by godly people who are taking accountability for shaping you. And I don't take that for granted, but I also want to stress, I think, the urgency. So the very first principle I have, which may not surprise you, is I think we need to open God's word every single day. I think the danger as a Christian 
is to get to the point where you become so enamored by other humans talking about God that you stop actually going directly to the Bible. I think there's a big danger in that. And you're going to study a lot of theology the next four years or wherever you are in your journey where you're going to see and get exposed to people like a Karl Barth or like a St. Augustine or like a C.S. Lewis. And they're fine to learn from, but they are not a replacement for God speaking to us directly. And that's something that I've noticed as I've gotten older is there are people who swear by Tim Keller who don't open the actual Bible or who swear by even like a Charles Spurgeon, who's a really faithful preacher, but who reads so much Spurgeon, they don't have time to read James or 1 Corinthians. And if we actually believe that the Bible is God's spoken word to us, it should be at the very top uh, of what we're doing uh, every day. There's nothing more important to us. And if you look at the safeguards, Drew and I were talking this morning, uh, because we do a lot of business things together, about um, a customer situation. And he was explaining to me how when you look at God's word, it will inform whether you give a customer a refund. It will inform how you treat your employees. It will inform whether you mislead people in your marketing or whether you pay taxes. Uh, I can give you so many examples. As a business owner, you could not pay for all kinds of things and run them through the business and the government would never know it. Like they would never really know if I tacked on an extra day to hang out with Dr. Lee and called it business, even though it has nothing to do with my business. They would never, like the way you treat employees, you know, if you let a bunch of people go and don't give them severance and they're like, a lot of times there's not a lot people can do. Like they're, they're at your mercy as an employer in some ways. If you, um, if you lie to customers, as odd as this sounds, it is not illegal to lie in the majority of industries in America. It like, so basically in healthcare and finance, you can't lie. You're allowed to lie in technology. You can say I'm the best accounting software ever and it's actually not true and I know it's not true and there's no punishment for that, which is kind of wild. But unless you're in financial services or healthcare when you're hurting consumers and you're saying my insurance product's the best or something, uh, there's a lot of uh, gray area and I have seen both Christians and non-Christians. I worked at a Fortune 50 company uh, and I was surprised by just the lack of discipline around things like being honest with customers. Like it really concerned me that we were uh, at a place I thought this can't be happening at a Fortune 50 company. This doesn't happen at, maybe at a small company, but the biggest companies in the world this can happen. And it, uh, my first day in sales, uh, the kids around me were lying, pretending to be calling from another company. Uh, and I wasn't willing to do that. And uh, and I was at a disadvantage and like we can get into that all worked itself out. But my, my point being like, you've got to decide uh, every morning that you're going to follow God. And the only source of that truth is the Bible. And I just be very, very careful of making someone else your God and their interpretation of the Bible. So a strong church and a great pastor, John uh, goes to a church who's like, I think one of the best pastors in America, uh, Colin Smith and who they work with, and I'll explain what they do in a second. Uh, it doesn't mean John can just listen to Colin talk about God all day. He has to have his own relationship with God. Um, and I actually, not to put you on the spot, but Open the Bible has been a big blessing to me. I don't know if you can give a 30-second plug because I think Open the Bible even a, makes it actually easier to do this habit every day. Yeah. Oh, this was not planned. So I, yeah. <laughs> op OpenTheBible.org uh, is visit it please it's got every biblical resource you could possibly imagine but the name says it all and miles is summarized well helping people get their bibles open help them read it can be intimidating for many people but being in god's word every day is as miles said the very best thing any of us can do as jesus followers so mm -hmm. business or not mm -hmm. it's a great practice to be in so yeah thank you yeah so so i i think i would start with that is the number one thing if you take nothing else from this the momentum is critical in following God and you do not, you want to build that habit. You're, I know you might feel like you're busy now. It is immensely harder as you get older. You'll have less time and more excuses and you'll have a little person that you're keeping alive all day, Lord willing. It gets massively harder to do these things. So I would say that's my, my very first piece of advice. If I could go back to me at, at 20 years old, now I'm 31, it would be Open the Bible every day and do not put anyone else as a proxy for your relationship with God. Because you do not want to put your hope in a pastor or a parent or a 
boyfriend or girlfriend or spouse or friend. You want to directly have your own relationship with God, and that comes from his word. The second thing uh, is prayer. So I, I think I'm guilty of this. I think we all can be guilty of this. It is easy to approach prayer with God. I've taken a list of my concerns and hard things you put in my life, and I would like you to convert them to not hard things. So show your faithfulness and my knee hurts. I'd like my knee not to hurt. Uh, like America's in trouble, please don't make America in trouble. And I think what God wants from us is dependence on him and a relationship with him that is much more than just being our you know, bank account we wanna withdraw from for requests. Uh, And so something that I think is really important to realize, there's a great quote, I don't know who said it, but it's, if dependence on God is our goal, weakness is an advantage. So if you look at most of the Bible stories, the faith of people like Moses or Joseph or Daniel or all the apostles, uh, it partly strikes us as so special because they had to believe. There's not a Bible story that I have come across that is just Miles was walking and Miles just got better and better and better and there was no hardship and Miles just followed God and trusted the whole time and it was so easy and sunny and it was just heaven on earth and then he waltzed his way into heaven. I think part of being a Christian, which we are told, is that there's going to be scars for following Jesus and those dependences on God Uh, I love this quote by Paul Washer. Most of the subjects of our prayer meetings are the purposes God has in our life. So you don't want to have that hard sports coach you might have at Wheaton. You don't want to have the getting a bad grade in class. You don't want to have the conflict or whatever it is. But before we wish it away, I think God wants us to have a personal relationship where we share how we're feeling and praise him and trust him in a way that I don't know is perfectly defined for us. The Lord's Prayer is a good starting point, but I think the point is uh, we need to pray a lot. And, and our dependence on God, that's how we show it. If we're not praying, you know, Jesus prayed for hours. If we think that we can get away with not praying at all and we're just going to, by sheer willpower, follow God's word, like God himself was praying, and he was a whole lot stronger than us, obviously. I think the second thing I would say is I really try to build in that habit and figure out whether it's walking, uh, whether um, something I actually asked Colin a couple weeks ago is just like, because I'm a big writer. So just like you can write out your prayers. You don't necessarily have to even be uh, like speaking to God like we normally think of with our eyes closed. Like there's, I think you can be creative as to how you communicate with God. But my my big point is I think prayer uh, and really remembering that God's power is what we're leaning on. So like when you look at the Lord's Prayer, it's like hallowed be your name is like you're separate from me. I want to depend on you. Things like praying to be kept from temptation, I think are really real prayers that God does answer when he promises if it's according to his will, like he will answer that prayer for us. Um, I think that's critical. And if me at 20 did not think that way. Me at 20 just thought, I'm just going to barn burn my way to everything I want, and I'm going to do a bunch of great things and slap a sticker on it and say, you're welcome, God. Like Me at 30 realizes how futile that is and how possible it is to start a good work and not finish it well or build the wrong thing, even if you avoid these big pitfalls because you're not actually doing it in accordance with God's will. Um, Third thing. Is I think you need to find godly mentors more than you look for friends. So what I would stress here is your friends are going to come and go. So most of your friends, as much as it's impossible to believe, if you are my age and you talk to more than two people that you're going to school with, you would probably be an anomaly based off the stats. So your life is going to come. And ultimately, like Drew and I were here at the same time. We talk almost every day. We didn't even know each other when we were here. My roommates from college, I don't really speak to very frequently anymore. Because what happens is, is you get used to these, you're, you get used to convenience, like we're going to the bowls or we're going to the burrito place or we're going to, and what happens is over time, those conversations when you're not having shared experiences become more looking back at things that weren't always that meaningful to start with. Whereas in reality, when you're working side by side, um, that connects you in a different way. But my relationships with mentors have stayed remarkably stronger than my relationships with peers. So I have talked to Dr. Lee most weeks since Wheaton, which is now hundreds of times. I've not talked to anyone who's a student next to me hundreds of times. My point is, I think you want to find godly mentors and particularly ones 
that are willing to tell you things you don't want to hear. So the other day I asked John a question where I was sort of asking him, can I do something for my brother? It would be a big stretch for my family, et cetera. And John's advice was, you know, we got to look out for your family here. That's not what I really want to hear in that moment. I want John to say, no, 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 this is great. You need people who can disagree with you, who you can trust enough to be both credible and care about you. And that can be your parents, but I think you want to have a bunch of those mentors. And a good rule of thumb is if you're about to make a major life decision, try to triangulate the advice of a bunch of godly mentors. So I'll give you a personal example. Before my wife, who's Sally not with me now, was actually engaged in the past before my wife, which I'll get into more learnings of what I would tell myself. But uh, it was a messy situation. Her family was really hard on her. So I, I won't get into all the details, but it's a very hard thing for me. But I brought the situation to about 10 people. Dr. Lee and I talked about it. Um, and one of them was actually who I wrote a letter to uh, and got to know really well was the last CFO of McDonald's. So it was just a complete stranger. I just happened to get to know. And I'll never forget, he told me, I'm 100% sure you should walk away from this and never turn back. And that uh, corroborated with the advice of lots of people, made it so I could do something which looking back now was a really good decision to walk away from. In the moment, I can't say I necessarily would have done without not just one mentor, not just my parents, like a lot of people, because godly wisdom does triangulate. I, 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 you, when you ask 10 people who are credible and care about you, who you know to love God and have spir spiritual maturity that you don't have, their advice will not be 50-50. Like it's going to look 90-10, almost always. And so my advice would be, as silly as it sounds, focus more on knowing him than knowing the other kids around you because they're actually going to come and go if the relationship's just bowling. You're going to need the relationships with mentors significantly more. And if there's anything that has helped me kind of shortcut some of these lessons or learnings or things, especially in career, it's been that I wrote a bunch of letters to people uh, over the years I've kept doing it to just get to know people way ahead of me. So I don't want to know someone that's like 32. I want to spend time with people like him that have done way more things than me and ask, what did you do? Uh, like I mentioned Colin uh, from John's church. I just asked him, I emailed him once, like, what did you do to know what you know about God? And he was kind enough to say, these are the steps I would take if I was you. Those are the people you want to focus on is who you want to become. And it's really easy to get focused on petty things like, um, just how you spend your money and how you spend your time and who's popular and this and that. And that's not what God wants us to focus on. He wants us to focus on becoming mature Christians, which the best path to that is spend time with mature Christians. So I would say the more you can do that, the better, because who you spend time with, you will become. Um, so fourth, and we'll stop at, at the end of six on the, uh, and do any questions on this half. Uh, this is going to sound funny, but I think you should replace TV with sermons almost entirely. So I have noticed, I live in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, I used to love country music. I, uh, it's all over the place. My next door neighbor is a rock star. Uh, and I realized listening to country music in America, uh, most of the messages are pretty unbiblical. Like the treatment of women, the view of wealth, the view of success, the view of, you know, I'm gonna prove you wrong or all these things, uh, they're pretty awful. There's not pretty much a single American country music song, and someone's laughing, that you can, uh, that you can play from a church pulpit. <laughs> you know, Luke Bryan, who, again, he's, he shops at the Publix next to my house now. Like, it's, it, it's fun to be in the community. Luke Bryan's songs, like, most people are good. Like, that is not what the Bible's saying. Like, it's the opposite. Or, I believe the streets of gold are worth the work. Jesus did the work, so we didn't have to. It's like... And as silly as it sounds, if you take an hour on your commute every day and you're listening to that, and then you someone breaks your heart and you're listening to that, and you're going to concerts and listening to that, it's going to change you. And the same thing is true with TV. As much as you think watching Billions or watching uh, Succession on HBO is not going to change you, it is everything we consume moves us a little bit. So something that I experienced, uh, I had a difficult legal situation, which I, uh, I can't really get into the specifics other than that I think it was a, a trial God blessed me with looking back. Uh, that situation, 
uh, coupled with other things in life, like over the years, those hard things, they push you to follow God. And the best spir- experiences of spiritual growth that I have had have been in those difficult times when I have switched watching Netflix for listening to four or five sermons a day. And so I just highly, highly, highly stress there's so much junk on Netflix. There's so much junk on Amazon. There's a show on Amazon about why Satan is actually the good guy in the biblical narrative. That's the number two show on Amazon. Like you do not want to go anywhere near that stuff. And to think it's not changing you, it TikTok is changing you. Instagram is changing you. A little bit of it, we can get into in business. There's cases where you need to use things like LinkedIn, but I think you have to be so careful about justifying sin because everyone else is watching it or it's not a big deal or it's not that explicit or it's just wealth. Wealth's not that scary. Like the Bible tells us the love of money is the root of all evil. The only reason we would watch billions is because it's just fascinating to think about the love of money. So I just, I would highly say these are all habits and you're in a time still where you can form these, like, like whether it's the open the Bible sermons, uh, Paul Washer is someone who I've really loved to listen to, um, John MacArthur, and there's tons of these people. You can find the one, Tim Keller, you can find the ones you like. But what I would just say is don't watch TV. I just, I really think it is like Satan's number one way at getting at us far and away is through media. And we just have to be so, so, so careful of how that will change us. And it's easy to be like, well, it's Disney. Disney made it. Disney's safe. Disney loves kids. It's like that is not the biblical standard for what we should be putting in our minds. Um, all right, the fifth one, I think you have to be super careful who you marry. So I would say uh, to the females, I think Titus 2, the recommendations for elder are what you should be looking at if you are trying to choose a spouse. And you are not marrying someone to change them. You can't change other people, only God can do that. You're not marrying someone as a mission project. Like, do not marry a disaster because it's your ministry to try to turn around a disaster. Like, if you marry a disaster, then I'm gonna tell you you have to stay with it and you made a tough decision. Uh, But we can hit me on LinkedIn if that happens. But uh, I think the point is this is the biggest life decision that you're going to make other than following Jesus. And it will have a enormous impact on your ability to follow God. Like if you marry a godly Proverbs 31 type spouse, like my wife, I would say is it's easy. I called her yesterday and said, Dr. Lee wants me to go to Thailand. We have a little baby to meet some refugees we've been trying to help. And her first response was, you should do it. Someone who's not concerned about honoring God is going to say, How, you can't leave me for four days with our baby. You can't. We're not spending money flying to another country. I, you don't get to do that without me. You did the last mission. What, like all these reasons. I have so many friends who cannot, who cannot in an unencumbered way serve God because they are weighed down by a spouse who does not want to serve God the way they do. And God can use that in a sanctifying way. And it does not mean we get to get out of that marriage, but it's critical to be so thoughtful. So I would tell like, if you are in a relationship and the other person is not like respecting your physical purity boundaries, like I am back to the McDonald's guy, I'm 100% sure you should cut them immediately. Like you are not, because unless you're on a path where you think in six months time, you wanna commit the rest of your life to following this person, you should not be dating them. And dating is not playing marriage. You don't, like the more you can save for your spouse, the better. And you just have to be so careful because the temptation is going to be that you think that God is not being faithful to you and there's not options that look like Proverbs 31 or Titus 2. So you're gonna take it into your own hands and you're gonna figure out where you can compromise from God's standards. And you should not do that. Because we are on earth to follow God. We are not on earth for our own gratification. And putting yourself in a position, the Bible warns that marriage is going to be hard regardless. And we're always going to be in tension with serving our spouse and serving God. But th- we, there's a, that's a continuum. And if you go down the path of someone who's not that interested in serving God, everything that it, it's going to become so hard. Parenting is going to be so hard. All the stuff I can explain to you that I've done in business, like we've, We've given away as a business hundreds of thousands of dollars. Like my wife and I don't have like 
some huge nest egg of money, like that's scary. Like you need a wife that says, if God's putting this on your heart, I'm not going to get in the way of God putting this on your heart. You don't want a wife who's saying, how dare you take the 401k? <laughs> like you can't do that with that because if I'm trying to deny myself, take up my cross, follow God, I need a partner that's like a fullback in pushing me to do that. And I just want to, again, stress, I have seen people who marry someone because they're the football star or because they're really beautiful or because, and the Bible tells us charm is deceptive, beauty is fleeting. That goes for both. I think in the context, it might be female, but that goes for both genders. We're all getting older or none of us are going to look good when we're 80. Like you do not want to sacrifice on this. And I cannot tell you how many people made a decision that if they truly want to follow God, they are stuck with following through on and God will use that. But it is up to you to decide to marry a godly spouse. And if there's not a godly spouse, then God is not trying to hurt you. There's a purpose in that, but do not settle because you're just, it's the worst decision you can make other than shooting someone. It's one of the only ones you cannot go back from. And it's so critical. And, and, and back to the mentors thing, your hormones in those types of situations are not, you're not going to be thinking clearly. So have 10 people. You can say when he met his wife to talk about the perspective of maturity he had at our age, he wanted, he asked God to show him a woman who prayed as the primary variable. And he met her in a chapel praying. So back to the praying thing, point two, if we truly want to walk with God that way, he will answer our prayers. If he doesn't, he has something better for us. But that is such a critical decision. My older sister years ago would have been here with me, made a very poor marriage decision because uh, she was desperate at about 30 years old and felt like God wasn't being faithful. I, I am not exaggerating. She ended up in a trailer. I have no idea where she is. She does not speak to any of our family. She is married, so she's now committed to that. And uh, it, it has in every way ruined her life. And that's her saying, God, you haven't been faithful, so I'm taking this into my own hands. And you do not want to make that mistake. So sixth one, and this is a subtle one, but uh, I think you need to decide where you are in a continuum of a little theology topic called um, being reformed. So you kind of hear about this debate, Calvinism versus Arminianism. Has anyone ever heard of Calvinism versus Arminianism? Yeah. So the basic idea, as I would sum it up, is that the Calvinist or reform perspective is that everything down to me being here and my hand going this way is ordained by God. We still have free will because we still get to choose, but those somehow conflict in a view called compatibilism, that God is both able to script every moment, yet I am still accountable for my decisions. It's hard to exactly understand how it works. The Arminian view is more that God is actually reacting to me. So I did this on my own will. It's just as likely I could have done this instead. And then based off what I do, God is then reacting. The problem with the Arminian view for me is that it takes a lot of the sovereignty off of God. So I had my own child. I think I probably would have been accidentally Arminian at 30. And I started to realize I am putting the pressure on myself to save my child based off how godly a life I live. Like that's not a pressure a human's supposed to bear. So I got into reading John Piper, who's a Wheaton grad. Um, Jonathan Edwards talks about this. Um, and basically, I, I can share a couple of books after, but uh, it, it really helped me to understand, I think, Reformed theology, it's called. I think to be in a place where you're actually understanding that God has scripted everything. I was supposed to meet Dr. Leo. I was supposed to meet John. I was supposed to meet Drew. The bad things that have happened to me, God didn't just allow them. He intended them. Like when you hear him explaining to Joseph with his brothers, um, that, that to me was a huge shift in my thinking that I wish I had made sooner because it, it takes a lot of the pressure. I think practically looking back, if you look at God as the author, it's helpful. And looking forward, I think we still do have free will. We're still accountable. It's not really functionally helpful to be like, I'm just going to stand here like an amoeba and see what happens. But um, I think that if you can sort of learn that type of thinking, which is generally called reformed. Um, I, I think it has really helped me. So I'll pause for a second. Uh, I know we just covered about 30 minutes of things. Did anyone have any questions on the first six? Yes. You go to church in Nashville. Um, so it's called Edgefield Baptist. Yeah. Um, yeah, in East Nashville. Yeah. Uh, when you talked about uh, 
choosing godly mentors over friends. Uh, how do you find that balance in the life you're living now? I know in the future you should prioritize mentors and stuff, but yeah, how do you combine both those in your current life? Yeah, so, so I think, I mean, practically speaking, you know, people like John and Dr. Lee don't really want to be your roommate. <laughs> So, I mean, I don't think. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so, I, I think you need to have friends. And I, I don't think it's that you don't need to be like, you know, 90% mentors when you're at your age. But I think to realize that these are the relationships are somewhat temporary and you'll realize it over time. I would just say the more time you can spend with people who are older, the better. So, I don't know the exact balance of what it looks like for you. I don't think you need to be extreme and, you know, I don't ever speak to anyone because I only speak to people who are 20 years older than me and successful or, uh, or whatever it might be. But I, I think functionally speaking, one of the best things I have done is I hardly spend any time with people my own age. <laughs> and they are actually really good friends. Like they actually want friends too. Like they come to see you if you speak in a class or they'll, you can text them emojis and like they are more like us than we realize. They don't, they're not as good at emojis as us. Yeah, they, they don't put periods on things and they say, that's fine. And you think, what did I do wrong? And they're like, I said, that's fine. <laughs> Um, but that, that's been my experience. Uh, in general, I think God will bring you great friends. Like Drew's an example of a friend that uh, is more in my stage of life. I think they're great, but I, I would just say the, like, the mentorship pieces I think where most people miss. Um, and and I, I, one other thing I'd say about that is really, really successful people that are really busy only can give so much of their time. So some people you'll meet uh, for whatever reason, if you don't hit it off with them or they don't, have, they don't see it as the right investment of their time, not everyone's going to want to pour into you that way. So you want to find people. So you just want to have a, a lot of casting a lot of nets and you'll hit it off with some people and other people uh, you won't. But I, I think that, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a huge hack. And the Bible tells us in the abundance of counselors, there's safety. It's not a, yeah. And I don't know about you guys, but I'd, I'd love as much safety as possible in this crazy world. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, great question. I think there's an age component, an experience component to mentorship that I look at mentorship more than just being tactical. So tactically, I probably know as much about how to run like LinkedIn ads as any, like I definitely probably in our business, we send like 70 million cold emails a year. So I know probably more about cold emailing than anyone on the planet. That's a tactical thing. You don't need a bunch of gray hair on someone. When you talk about things like who you should marry or something, I think these bigger strategic decisions, there's a wisdom that comes with age. And that's why we have the word elder. I think part of it kind of baked into it is like, it, there's an age component to it. Like not that we want, we don't want people to look down on us because we're young. Like I understand the converse argument, but there, I think there's a, there's a wisdom that comes with learned experience that is somewhat difficult. So Ray Dalio has a good rule, you know, someone has to have two successes or something before you listen to them. So hypothetically, could I be mentored by a 24 year old that's just great at marriage or something and I'm 31 and they've been married for eight years or something like, maybe I, they would have gotten married very young at 16. <laughs> Doesn't seem, but uh, yeah, I think possibly, but I would generally say, I think with mentors, you, they're filling a different role than the tactical relationships, if that makes sense. Uh, does that help? Sort of. Yeah, okay, sorry. All right, any other questions? No? Okay, all right, so so we'll jump to the career ones, but we can always go back to those. Um, so for context, I have about 15 employees uh, and we serve collectively about 170 or 180 companies uh, doing two things. So we help them get meetings on their sales calendar and we help them build their brands on LinkedIn. Um, and I've been doing it for about six years. Um, started as one customer um, where basically got paid like $6,000 a month to do a bunch of sales work. Um, now our business collectively does um, about $300,000 a month of revenue. So it's sort of incrementally grown in five years. Um, and I didn't wanna bore you with all the details of the stories or things, but I, I just, I sort of had these same few principles that, um, I think whatever you do, whether you do sales technology or something else, are 
hopefully applicable. So the very first one is, I think you have to learn to work hard. And what I would define as hard is working from 7 a.m. to 12 a.m., uh, six days a week. And you have to decide on a curve where you'd like to be. Because if you look at, in America, like if you think about like the top 1% in America makes something like $450,000 a year. There's the average American family makes something like $50,000 a year. And, uh, and this is, I, maybe it might be like 70 if it's a joint income household. It, you need to decide, and I, God does not want us to store up wealth for ourselves. I think wealth is a great tool for generosity and impact. I like what John Piper says, you can make as much as you want in the sport of business, but you gotta be really careful about keeping it. Like uh, I, the theology of what to do with money is a bigger discussion. But just in terms of effectiveness, you're paid this because of the value you're adding to other people. So if you wanna get paid $450,000, you probably have to add over a million dollars of value to other people. So we are paid as employees, as companies. Like we buy Apple's iPhones for $1,000 because we think we're getting at least $1,000 of value. Ideally, we think we're getting $2,000 of value and we'd be willing to pay even more. And there's a concept called buyer profit and seller profit where buyer profit is the value I'm getting in addition to what I paid for this. Seller profit is the margin they are making. Maybe they made the phone for 600, they're selling for 1,000, so the 400 is called seller profit. Without getting too deep into that, the, you can get to this level by the time you are 30, exclusively by working hard. There's a gazillion people in America making like this top 1% level in every single field, whether it's like accounting or medicine or insurance sales or siding or mowing other people's lawns. There are people making $3 million a year plumbing toilets all over the country. And it's just exclusively effort. So what I would stress is when you are in your 20s, you need to decide how serious you want your career to be. And do you want to be like, do you really want to be at the top of your craft or do you want to be, you know, more average or do you want to be potentially like just another person who does something? That's up to you, but it's impossible to divorce time into this from getting here. Because even in the world of AI, the people using AI 20 hours a day are going to kill the people sort of using it four hours a day. So there's a principle in a book called Deep Work. And the focus of deep work, the idea is complex tasks like working with AI, it's the amount of time you do it and the amount of focus you have. So working 20 hours a day is not the only goal, it's getting things done that actually matters, but they're hard to separate. So what I would just stress is in your 20s, if you're not watching TV, if you're not spending a bunch of money on entertainment, if you're not doing all these other pieces that waste time, I have consistently worked basically 7 a.m. to midnight for the last decade, and it has worked so much better than I ever would have imagined for building something. And my wife met me when I was doing that. Like, she thinks it's great. Like, again, we're back to the spouse thing. You need to find someone who really loves you for you. I think that uh, the fuel for it's come from generosity and serving the world with our business and giving back money to causes and people. I don't think the accumulation of wealth is the right motive, but I just want to just like stress, if you want to be the best at anything, if you go work at Deloitte, every one of your peers is going to want to work 45 hours a week and go to the bar every night. If you decide to work 80 hours a week, like there is a cause and effect where you're more prepared for meetings, where your work quality is better. And for the first couple months, it's going to look like this, where you're, you're working your 80 hours and they're working their 40 hours. And then what's going to happen over time is you're slowly going to go like this. And usually it hits an inflection point where then it goes like this. And because everything's exponential in business and getting to this point where you're so good at something or people start to know your effort level or your quality of work, the only way to break through if you're self-made, if you're not starting with a trust fund or something, the way to speed up that process is effort. And I, I have a customer that has a $200 million life insurance business that I don't even know if he has a high school GED, just exclusively this. And he has a quote, he tells all his people, do more now, get better later. The idea is everyone else wants to read about things and dream about things and watch YouTube videos on how to be successful. And he just dialed people to sell them insurance for 18 hours a day for seven years and he built a $200 million company. 
What you want to do with your life is up to you. If you want to be a doctor or a missionary, and I, I don't think this means you don't need to sleep. I don't think this means you should sacrifice time with God. I don't think this means you should sacrifice uh, time with your family or uh, important people in your life. But there is so much room if you cut out the junk that like this morning to be with you guys, I had to wake up at, I, was like, I think it was like five in the morning to write content. Like it doesn't phase me anymore. Like I just, I like pulling all nighters is just so normal to me and your body can take it when you're in your 20s it just it, it, it's durable like it, i love it's not going to kill you like you don't want to do it every night my point being like if you're serious about thinking you want to be at the top the only way to get there if you're not starting at an unfair starting point which everyone we all have unfair starting points just being in college here but i'm just saying the, to make the most of what you have it is impossible to separate work ethic and i wish someone had told me that because I think I learned it over time, but I didn't realize the fact that it's basically cause and effect. If you run into anyone who has built something like John's built something or the career you've built, people who get tenure faster in professorships, uh, you know, pastors of churches, like they work incredibly hard. And there's just, there's a cause and effect. And we're told in Colossians 3.23 to work for God's glory. Uh, I, you know, we're only given Sundays off in the Bible. Like just, it's just an interesting perspective. Like there's a seventh day of rest, like, it's a luxury to have Saturdays off. And depending on what you want to accomplish, uh, this, I think, is the fastest, the one thing you can see in all people who are successful. There's a lot of variation. Almost always, it's an effort level. If you look at Elon Musk, he's the epitome. I mean, he's taking on like 56 car companies at once with four other companies. And he explicitly says in all his talks at colleges, you work eight hours a day, I work 16 hours a day, and I'm learning and accomplishing twice as fast as you. And eventually it gets to be unfair because in the world we live in now with social media, if you're the best content creator, you're not getting, if you're twice as good at creating content as the next person, you're not getting twice as many views. You're getting 2,000 times as many views. If you get 2,000 times as many views for long enough, then you start, it, it's so exponential because what AI is doing is it's weeding out all the inefficiencies in our economy that you really have to be able to compete and see yourself like a stock. So whatever it is you're doing, you're managing the company of you, how you learn, how you invest in yourself, how you market yourself, your personal brand. All those things matter immensely and they all take time. And so I, I think what you'll notice about people who are busy is they get hit up with a lot of requests where someone says, oh, John, I really, really admire you. I would just be happy to work for free for you. And he probably gets this all the time. The real way to get John's attention is to do the thing for free for him and then send it to him. <laughs> like, John, I took all your Open the Bible videos and I've taken the liberty of editing them all for you and giving them to you. Can I be your video editor? He's tired. The world's tired of telling. Everyone wants to say, John, I'm so smart. If you just give me a chance. It's like, he, he's so busy. I have to show him. Like the same thing relationally is true. Uh, some of these pe people that I've gotten to know over the years, uh, like famous authors and things, I've flown to meet with them. Like, to, can I get on a plane just to meet you? Because if you do that, it shows them like, I'm serious about this. I'm not just wasting your time. And we're in a show me economy. Everything is, is, no one cares what you say about yourself anymore. They don't care if on your resume it says, I'm a results driven, I, you know, run through a brick wall for my employer. Everyone thinks you're lying. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. It's just you have to be able to show it. And showing it is going to come from being on that battlefield and having the scars and wounds and learnings that you actually understand it. Because sales used to be about 20 years ago. Oh, John, tell me your needs. Or you want to email more people? That's really great. Now it's like, John, I can tell you every single thing about Google Spam Filter because I wrestle it like a bear like 30 hours a week. What do you want to know about it? And he's deciding whether to buy, not because I'm looking into his eyes and he's like, oh, Miles just understands me. It's like this person actually knows what they're doing. And I'm going to get fired in two seconds if I don't. So you really got to be able to show it. The world, I don't think people realize, the world is ruthlessly competitive and it's becoming ruthlessly efficient. Like a lot of Drew's business is based off putting videos up that are higher quality because that little 2% difference of quality is the difference between millions of views and nothing. Like you could go on Twitter and start posting all day and post thousands of times and if the content's not good, the world their algorithm will notice and suffocate it. So the, my point being, 
we've got to take really seriously in this AI world, we're going to have less employees. You can already see the studies. There's less white collar jobs. They're getting replaced. Like blue collar jobs are obviously a little different. But the white collar jobs that we all want to be in, you don't need as many in a world where robots can do these things, where um, asynchronous video replaces the need for email, where spreadsheets get ingested by machines and they give us insights. And we're already starting to see this. And we're seeing with our team, our team now is smaller than it has been doing double the number of clients. So the employees are making way more at our company, but we don't need as many of them. So I used to come here and be like, who wants to work for us? We need bodies. I don't need any bodies anymore. Like I just need to keep upskilling the AI of the people. As long as I keep the people I have, they're figuring out how to go from 60 to 80 to 100 to 120 clients. We have individual two-person teams doing 100 clients where when I started like coming here, it was probably 20, one person could do 20 max. So my point being, you want to get on this curve and learn but it's not all doom, like it's not all doom and gloom. Like if you work hard, there's never been so much opportunity because the work ethic bar in our country has gotten so low that it actually working 40 hours a week is a remarkable miracle. Like most people are moonlighting or watching Netflix like at their desk, like just to get to that basic level. But if you commit yourself to, I'm gonna take this craft as seriously as an Olympic athlete would, or I'm gonna take this craft as seriously as LeBron takes playing basketball, uh, it is remarkable how much the world will get out of your way. And so I just want to stress, you have to decide for you, because not everyone is going to be of the opinion that they need to be the top 1% of what they're doing. But it, something John Rockefeller told his son, you look at the people who get over the hump in anything, and I'm, the money's not so much the point. It's more the success, like just the being valuable to the people in the business ecosystem. My point being, though, there's people who get to top 1% and all kinds of things that don't have college degrees, that had one parent, that parents were in prison. Like it, it's not, the starting point does not dictate the end point. And we, I, I'm not a motivational speaker. I'm just telling you having 200 clients, I've seen people that have done things that people with backgrounds started way ahead of couldn't. And I've seen the opposite. And the point is you just gotta want it. So the next thing I would say is how do you get yourself to that love of it is you have to love what you're doing. So I was thinking about it in the case of John. John loves sales. So he built a, a sales and training company. He now uh, more or less sells people and reading the Bible all day. John would die if he was the CFO of JP Morgan. There's no selling. So we could say, John, you could work with Jamie Dimon. You could sit in New York. He'd be like, it would kill him. It'd be like, look at these spreadsheets. Look at so same thing with Dr. Lee. This guy, like, if you heard his life story, he lives on the edge. Like, he went to Pakistan and was in a van and like with like terrorist riots. He's just smiling, telling me the story. Like wasn't a big like he's made by God with a gift to bring the gospel and bring entrepreneurship to people in marginalized places. He would die not being able to do that because that's the gift. Like for me, when I was in your guys' shoes, I started to write letters to famous business people. I read a book called How to Win Friends and Influence People. I built an entire business around that love of reaching people. So now I get to do it for like you know hundreds of people doing it for them because I love it so much more. They, if they don't love it, that's where your competitive advantage is going to come from. And the world is not, it's not, don't think about it like the entire economy. Think about like in your niche, there's not that many people that are really passionate about getting connected to strangers as a job. I don't have that many competitors. Drew and high-end video, there's not that many people that geek out about all these cameras. There's not that many people that want to bring global entrepreneurship or that many people that love sales and training. So figure out what you love because the worst motivation is the starting point. You're, if you look at this and say, I want to make a certain level of income, the danger is you Google search how to make $400,000 a year and it says, well, the number one way to do that is to be a doctor. As so you say, well, I want to make $400,000. I'm going to go be a doctor. If you don't love biology and medicine and like I would die as a doctor because there's nothing to break. You just sit there and talk to the patients and be like, oh, another knee surgery, like collect my, I, I think you'd die as a doctor. We'd get bored. <laughs> they'd, they'd fire us for mess. You'd die if I were your doctor. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so my point is figure out what you love. Cause for me, I've built a business around loving it so much that I could do it till midnight every night. Like I, I work with Drew on his LinkedIn brand, but I work on my own LinkedIn brand more than anyone's cause I love it. And that I think is, if I've learned anything is ignore the way it's not about what other people think. It's not about how much money you make. If you find what you love, 
I think that is actually the path when you're in your stage to eventually being as successful as you want to be by then working hard. And I'll give you a great example. I have a friend in New York City who's one of the best artists in the world. Makes a ton of money selling paintings. He loves it. He paints day and night at two in the morning with his parrot. And if you tell him I love your work, he looks you in the eye and says, thank you, I try really hard. I've always thought that was funny. Uh, <laughs> but that guy's the best as a painter. The 79th best painter, like, can't afford groceries. My point is like figure out what you love and it's not necessarily about money. You can have hobbies that aren't your job, but as much as you can, if you, if you do that and you can get in a circle of where you're gifted and where the world has demand for your gift, that's ultimately where I think business success comes from. The final thing I'll say, and then uh, we can do questions, is, uh, is two things. I think one is you need to be scared of wealth biblically because wealth can corrode us and the best antidote to to the love of money is giving it away. And God promises us if we give it away, it'll come back to us. But if you're blessed to make a inordinate amounts of money, you have to be inordinately generous or it will corrupt us. And there's so many examples. There's an example, Alan Barnhart, uh, who Dr. Lee knows, who committed giving God 50% of the income of his business when it was a million dollar business. Now they're a $500 million business and they give away I don't know, tens of millions of dollars every year. Uh, and he capped his income at $100,000 because he was um, yeah, afraid of what wealth could do to him. So it's going to take time for all these things to play out. But if they do play out a certain way, I think the final thing I would just say is we're here to build God's kingdom. We're going to be accountable for what we do with the gifts we're given. We have to be really thoughtful about if we are blessed with above average success, we need to be above averagely sacrificial with that success because God is not honored by me making millions of dollars and just keeping it for me. And I can say it's for my family or whatever, but it's like at the end of the day, it says don't store up wealth. It doesn't say don't store up wealth for yourself. So like if you have control of it, you're storing it up for you. Um, so hope that was interesting at least a little bit. I can definitely answer any other uh, questions if anyone has them. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so I'm looking at applying to some of like my first internships and like getting a job out of college. And I would argue that I'm a hard worker, but I think getting my foot in the door is more what intimidates me rather than like proving that I'm willing to work hard at something. How would you argue or like, like advise someone who is like maybe, maybe not me, but like a hard worker and like looking just, yeah, get the film. Yeah, so, so if, you, if you read an Elon Musk, there's, this has been written about a bunch of times. When he came to America from South Africa and wanted to work in banking, uh, he like wrote letters to all of the bankers. Like it was just like a sheer force example. Like, uh, and uh, when you read about Sylvester Stallone, he wanted to sell the Rocky script so bad, he sat in the lobby of a movie producer overnight so they wouldn't meet with him the whole day and he stayed there overnight in his suit and the next morning, like, why is this guy still here? We'll hear him out. Uh, and those are extreme examples, but I, I think it is just effort. Like if you buy Amazon Prime packages and ship them to office addresses, like every seventh person will meet with you. Like just if you know what you're like, if you email a bunch of people, thoughtful, personalized emails, like half of them will meet with you. So I, I had a friend that wanted to get into sales in Boston. Like we wrote handwritten notes to leaders. Like he got hired at a big company. Like it, I think that it, that desire is what they're looking for. Because if someone's getting inundated all day, uh, they need to see that you want it more. So what I would say is like, if you're having a hard time getting your foot in the door, like stay on people. Like do weird things, like send a guitar song of like the seventh email to them is like, I'm playing you a guitar song because I'm so excited to work for you because people don't know what to do. And I can, I don't know if I can totally speak for John, but if I'm more scared of what you're going to do, if I don't say yes, I'll eventually say yes. <laughs> and I've seen it work a hundred times. And it's just, I think it is the, the world screens for desire. So I've noticed like if you really want a customer, the best thing to do is say, I'll work for free for you for a month or something because very few people will. Like, so I would just say getting your foot in the door is the same game of you need to just get attention. And when you're there, the more, like if, if you get a meeting and it's an easy to land meeting and I, I emailed John and said, can I work for you? He says, sure, come over to my office. If it was that easy to land, it's probably gonna, like there's something off. If it's 25 times I can't get a hold of him, there's probably a lot of value there 
probably someone of importance or busy. So I got to be that person who hits him 25 times and because he needs to see a little bit of his own persistence or himself in me. When he does, that's usually going to be someone that's a more valuable relationship. The same thing's true with jobs. Um, but I, th I think what I would say is we can talk about it separately. I would say like write handwritten notes, send a lot of emails, get an automation tool like Lemlist, get an account to like Apollo.io, offer to buy lunch for people and just automate. I would have, if I was in your shoes, I'd probably be automating emailing 100 people a day with Lemlist. Because every day I'd be like, I want to buy you lunch to these 100 people. And you'd probably get 20 lunches a day. And your parents would probably be like, who taught you this? But a kid did this after we talked about it. And he met Harrison Ford through the class talk. Yeah. <laughs> so we have seen it. Yeah. Yeah. But to extent what you're saying about the, like, the necessity and benefits of hard work in order to actually achieve human success, but what would you say, like, for you, what's your goal in that success? Like, why, why do you want to serve 200 clients instead of 100 clients? Like, what makes it a yeah, I think it's a great question. Uh, I think we're complicated creatures, and there's probably some amount of sinful intention in all of us always. So I don't, I don't know that we can even always see it. I think I would like to think that working so hard. So my dad's a very successful entrepreneur. I think I saw those values model and passed down to me. I think that's had a big impact on me wanting that for my kids. I think why I would want to serve more clients is because like he's got a funnel where every dollar we can give him, uh, was it how many people have reached the Bible? Like 20 people or something? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, it's just like, so there's a lot of causes. Like we're gonna go to Thailand and there's refugees that got bombed and if you give them $10,000 is like food for a month for a whole. So I think as long as you're connected to generosity, it is somewhat linear. So what I've noticed is over time, the ability to help more people and somewhat provide for your family, but I just I think you just have to be careful of making it about like I want to pile up money so I have stability because stability is kind of a myth. So my wife and I talk a lot about trying to fight the temptation to do that because it is a temptation to to start out with. So we have a linear commitment in our business where we'll not give less than ten percent of the profit away as a company. Um, we often have done more than that, but I think you want to have these safeguards in place. So if he knew I wasn't doing that, like he would hold me accountable. Or he knows all my numbers. He looks at my numbers. So he's like, hey, you, what happened? Like we're buying yourself a new car. I said, like, that's, that's why I'm back to safeguards. I think they can help you keep your intentions. But in short, um, I think the more influence like you have in theory, if you're using it for God's glory, um, but with that said, I don't. I think the working hard for me for God's glory isn't necessarily just about that. I think it's just giving your best effort. And if God doesn't bless it and I have five clients again, I think I'd want to do this because it's a willingness to put my best forth for God. And I've found, like, you don't want to do anything crazy, but I think most of us are longing to work for something that hard, like LeBron gets to work for basketball. So I think if you can find that, um, it doesn't feel like work, as cliche as it sounds. Like, I really can't imagine not doing it, which is weird. But, like, my wife wants to go to the beach, and it's like, I just don't know what to do at the beach. Like, she like, watch this TV show. It's like, I, I can't watch TV shows by themselves. Like, it becomes kind of part of you. Yeah, which is fun. Yeah. How do you balance your, like, work life with your personal life? I blend them a lot. So I don't have friends that I don't have some type of work connection to unless my wife is friends with their wife. Like, yeah, someone's like, I'm new to the area. I'm a teacher. It's like, that's great. Like, if you need any help, let me know. Like, you should probably get to know other teachers. It's like, Drew and I are doing the same thing. And I just found, like, that commonality is a bond that, uh, for me, I think it just makes it easy to blend them. I don't think that's necessarily how everyone does it. But I think the enduring relationships, you've usually got to have some kind of commonality. And church, uh, being part of a church community and membership in a church, I think, does span that a little bit because those relationships like i have relations with people that don't have anything to do with work via church in a local church but i think as much as outside of things like small group i've just found that that works the best for me because it's kind of two birds with one stone um not that everyone should do it that way but i think that uh like yeah i think if you were like a teacher we'd have less to talk about probably yeah i don't know you've probably seen the same thing in your life i think they kind of those interests gather you yeah and some people aren't able to do it and yeah. sometimes you get to a point where you can't balance it. I, mm -hmm. I stepped down from running my company in its heyday because I didn't know how to slow down and was missing my kid. Just be aware of what the Lord's saying inside of you. And Miles is, he thinks I'm mentoring him. That's the beauty of this. This is awesome. Mm -hmm. 
good counsel from somebody that's young in all seriousness. Yeah, well, I listen to Dr. Lee. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Um, you talked sensibly about how your work week and your work ethic is set. Uh, what does your Sabbath look like? How do you damn it? What is, yeah. So I've only touched uh, I've only touched work twice in seven years on a Sunday, which I wish it was zero. Uh, yeah, basically I, I have a different phone, so I don't even have my work phone on me. I don't have email. I don't actually have any apps on this. It's basically like just a few people can text me. So none of the customers. Uh, and yeah, basically we go to church. We usually go out to lunch. We usually walk around. I usually like read the Bible, watch sermons. That's when I'd be reading more like Tim Keller type stuff. Um, take Charlie to the pool. Like I've definitely, ever since I started this counterbalance with like very extreme Sabbath the other, like I won't even really read business books or like reading HBR would be a non Sabbath activity. Like I'm not like whiteboarding out my dreams or something. I think you just have to be really careful because, uh, because that I think is the biblical template. I don't think there's anything wrong with pushing hard. It's just God's also telling us if you're going to push hard, you you need to take time off too. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is, I think for your spouse, if you, I think what my wife would say is it creates different challenges and opportunities. But um, but we've done it all together. So I mean, she does all the billing in our business. Like it's been a lot of fun. Like so, we're not necessarily trading off time with each other because we work remotely and we're doing it every day together. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is like possibly an unanswerable, but um, like if you're in a position in which you feel like you do not have a lot of experience, you don't know what it is that you want to do with your life, you try and find this thing you really do enjoy and make it um, like a career out of it. Um, like, what is like one really helpful strategy besides just do more that is like? Because yeah, I just keep trying things until you find it. Like, I think you'll like what you're good at. So if you can figure out what you're good at, uh, you, you may fall into liking it. So like, if I didn't feel like I liked anything, I'd try to figure out what I was good at. And Dr. Lee had us do something years ago that was asking other people what we'd be good at. So that's what got me into sales was other people said you should be in sales. Cause I thought sales wasn't prestigious enough for some dumb thing. Uh, and so I, I would just say, ask other people what you're good at and then just start there. And then if you work like a barn burner, that'll help you regardless. You know, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Can we uh, show our appreciation to you? Oh, thank you.